What is going on everyone? Alex Corbisera here, ambassador for ASM scholarships. And you know, people always ask me, do American universities have rugby? Are there scholarships? What does the landscape look like? Well, to answer all those questions, I have put together a webinar. I have brought in Rugby World Cup winning legend Brian Habana and UCLA rugby head coach Dave Clancy to talk all things American rugby. We break in the process, the applications, the pathways to the MLR, how it works, what coaches are looking for in recruits, what the education is like, what the whole system is like. To find all that out, stay tuned to the webinar. Unfortunately, we lost the first five minutes of the Zoom, but we've got all all the good details in there. Enjoy it. Let's go. Um, it's something to also take into consideration, which I think becomes important. So for me, I think it would have been probably in grade 11 in South Africa, which is the second last year of my schooling, potentially to already start looking, you know, at the opportunity um, to then look at the processes of, you know, whether you're using a, a medium like a country heard service of ASM or do try and do it yourself, which becomes a lot tougher because you actually just don't know what is going on there. So I think looking back, if I was to do it, it'd be doing an incredible amount of research because it's not just a, a fly by night, you know, getting entry point into, into the American system, uh, understanding who you can approach. I know in South Africa, there's quite a few ASM scholarship um, agent type um, scouts. individuals who yeah. scouts who, who reach out, via social media, um, you know, and I get quite a few questions, you know, is this legit, you know, your face is on there. Um, so it's understanding, you know, what that scout's role is within the organization and how they can assist you. Um, and then it's doing your research and being thorough um, in not leaving any stern unturn unturned. Okay, exactly. So I think, Brian, you've highlighted a lot of the key topics that I think we would like to try and dispel or, or you know, enlighten more based on what ASM. The thing with coming to university in America is with the fact with rugby right now, certain sports that are complete free rides where you would pay our, our concierge fee, which, you know, ranges around four and a half thousand dollars upwards, but you would be saving tremendous amounts of money on the actual tuition and fees. With rugby, there are some free rides, but the majority are partial scholarships of 40, 50% and combined with academic Op options as well and and that's sort of what we're looking at so to even start coming to america and planning your dream you have to be as a student in, in rugby you know financially support uh, able to be supported by your family or you know, as we're going to follow into other options with student loans and opportunities that can come with that in certain countries around the world but the fact is you have to at least have the finances to be able to 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 pay some tuition fees to pay cost of living and then to pay for a service like ASM. And why would you pay for a service like ASM? The reason is, is that it takes a lot of work to get this American dream up and running. You have to do your research. You have to, you know, reach out to coaches. You have to find the schools, the programs, you know, what, what, what you would you like from your experience? What school is looking for a player potentially in your position that you might be a great fit for. And that's where this can become quite costly and time consuming because in America, every application to every school comes with an application fee. It's part of you email, you process, you write an individual application per school. So immediately, if I don't know the one school I want to go to, I'm already accumulating multiple costs just on the application process alone, let alone now what ASM do is we say, come to us. We say, okay, let's make you basically an application or a profile. We're going to do an essay about you. We're going to learn about you. We're going to get your academic uh all your academic um achievements up there your grade point average what you know courses you're doing what your predicted grades all of this packaged up nicely we're going to get your rugby acumen out there your highlights you know your career stats where you've played everything then we're going to know a little bit about you and then we're going to go out and search and find coaches and programs that fit you and without actually filling out any applications yet we're going to do a lot of that groundwork of introducing to the coach, showing him your highlights, finding out, you know, what schools you want to go to and what opportunities might match up well with you. And then we're going to present you an op option list of what we've brought you. And so coming onto our concierge service, there's usually an upfront just deposit. And that deposit covers the time of ASM to create your profile and then to ship it around and present you with options. Once we give you options, if you want to take one of those options, then you would be on one of our, our different tiered status 
uh, programs where you would pay the fee, but then you're di corrected directly with the school. You get, you know, all your visa assistance application. As Dave touched earlier with the SAT, we will find and figure out where the best place for you to do your SAT is. Make sure you have all the training resources and, and, the, un and, and the stuff to get prepared for that. We really sort of do a lot of the heavy lifting for the, for the students that are, are fortunate enough to have the financial resources behind them to be able to to use a service like us and make it very possible for you then to go do i want to come to america yes or no as such like here is my you know here are my options and and you know just for the deposit alone you at least give yourself that opportunity for some students it, you know, we, we offer a lot of online resources on asmscholarships.com of, of how to's to do it yourself and, and encourage players who can't afford it, um, to, to, who can't afford it as such, to try and give you the tools to do it yourself. But for those that want the service, that want that access, that have the financial backing, that are prepared to be able to pay to go to University of America, ASM Scholarships, uh, you know, offers a really tidy program for you there that, that make this sort of application process as such a lot easier for you and a, a lot easier to navigate. Um, I think, you know, Brian, I think you touched it on there uh, with mm. the questions. You yeah, just so I, I think let's uh, let's just open up the chat, you know, if, if people do have questions, obviously we're not going to be able to allow participants to ask. I think there is also an understanding, and again, we don't want to be blunt, but, you know, if you are looking for a pro contract in America, you know, ASM is probably not the route you're going to go because that's a two, three, four year process of being in the system within the States. You know, if you if you really believe you, you have what it takes, and you know, I think from a South African perspective, you're either looking to get into one of the franchises within South Africa or you're then potentially having to find an agent looking for a role in the UK, in France, um, in Japan, potentially that's becoming a, a very hot uh, contested market now for players. So, you know, when you hear of ASM scholarships, when you think of the American dream, particularly as a school goer, um, you know, you can't think that you're immediately going to get into the American system with a pro contract. Um, you know, I think that's one of the immediate things that you have to dispel. You know, ASM is that conscientious service that, aids you in the process of getting you within to the collegiate system. And obviously there's, you know, there's quite a, 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 lot, a lengthy process in terms of that. It's not just a one week process. It's understanding that it's going to take time. It's going to take a lot of effort. You know, you have to upload or you have to be getting people video recording you on your matches in your games. And in South Africa, we have a few schoolboy games that are on television but a lot of them aren't so you, you're needing your highlights you know continuously uploaded on a youtube or get your link going so i think just dispelling that you're not you know asm is not going to get you a pro contract in the u.s um, it's allowing you this opportunity to see if you can get into the collegiate system and make it a lot easier and not effortless but a lot <laughs> simpler uh, in terms of if you don't understand the landscape uh, absolutely and, and i think that that's a great point to highlight brian is that if you, you look at this the ASM is, we're not going to say, hey, we're going to take you at 19, 20, 21 and just sign you in the MLR. The, the, one of the biggest issues is someone are, are, who's worked in the MLR that's helped players get recruited that the MLR has is the American immigration system. And so basically, you know, for the opportunities over in America, um, the hardest point is qualifying for the visa to be able to be a professional rugby player in America. It takes, you know, some form of considerable accolade. So for, we were going to, this is, you know, part of the later tier on the MLR, but in a nutshell, basically, unless you've played for your country, you've played sevens, under 20s for your country, or played at probably like the super level to the premiership level to that equivalent, it is very, very hard, almost impossible to get a visa. And it will mean that a lot of teams won't take the chance on you because there's a strong, they have to pay four or $5,000 in legal fees to try and get this visa. And if you aren't a strong applicant, and the chances you're not going to get signed, they're going to be less inclined to look at you. So it really restricts that pool. And what it does, it means for the opportunities for the MLR, and if that is a potential vision on you, say you miss that top tier level of the academy and the next step in the South Africa system, is that the best way to get into the MLR is through the university system. You get a great degree, you get a world-class like SNC and all the you know support and facilities of of what the American colleges can offer, but you also, on top of that, you know, you get the pathway that there is a direct draft from the, from the collegiate system into the MLR teams that just had its first one this year. It's happening every annually. The the, the hardest part that the the 
MLR teams have is start finding enough US-based players, enough players where they don't have to go out and get foreign visas. There's also the time that being in the country for, for long enough, you start to be able to potentially qualify for America, a few years in the MLR, and then potentially move on you know, to US national honors, which I know is a big, you know, big thing in South Africa is a lot of players have ended up playing representative honors for other countries of how rugby took them to that journey. I think America is one that we're going to see more and more of that as the MLR and collegiate keep growing. And, and you really get that benefit to then as you finish your degree, you have the option to go to the MLR and earn your stripes there and prove that you can play there. You're in a great shop window for all the MLR teams that are going to see you, see your stats, know who you are because they're all picking and drafting what players decide. And as the league keeps growing, that more teams need more and more players. The collegiate options is the best place. But then on top of that, say you don't make it for rugby or say you do your four years there, you get your degree. And actually, you could still go back with ASM and us with, with the connections that we have and, and the partnerships we've built. We'll send you back to South Africa, send you to the premiership, send you to the, the place. Or you say you decide I've had my collegiate, I've got my degree, I've got a world-class degree. I'm looking at my employment options. We partner with... Um, We've partnered with recruitment services to help facilitate because you have a one year window to get a company to sponsor you, to employ you so you can stay in the United States. Because you could do four years there, have the time of your life, make all the friends in the world, have a great degree. But without that company that wants to say, yes, we're sponsoring him past that one year, you have to go home. And so ASM really sort of as part of the whole package, we're really facilitating sort of a, a chance, a pathway to, to, to bring your life to America. I think another thing, Corbs, to mention as well is like it's a well-worn route, but you know it's so competitive whether you're in England, whether you're in South Africa, to get into a Super Rugby franchise, to get into an academy at 17 or 18 years old. And what we've seen happen with someone like AJ McGinty coming out of the Irish system, went to Life University, now he's the fly half for Sale Sharks, back in the Premiership, cap for the Eagles. You've got someone like Wesley White came over, spent four years at Lindenwood University. Here he's now training with the Springbok 7 side. So there are guys who are getting a second bite at the cherry through developing in an alternate route in America where there's full-time environment, high-performance S&C, really competitive rugby, and they're getting a second opportunity at their rugby careers by coming here. Absolutely. And, and I think that that is such a big story is that players, the, the, the hard part of the academy system and the rugby sort of you know funneling players through is that by seven or 18, most pro professional clubs need to make a decision on you and need to decide like, you know, are we going to invest resources, time and money? And sometimes, you know, players don't develop enough at that point, but that doesn't mean their trajectory is not going to get them to the, to the elite level. And so a lot of these guys miss that initial cutoff. I almost did that with my own career, but, you know, just through, you know, right time, right place, managed to get picked up by London Irish at 17. But if you don't, now you're in a place where you have to find a good option for you to develop. And there's been so many cases, AJ McGinty, Dylan Fawcett, um, you know, guys such as, you know, in South Africa that have come over to the UK at a young age and end up playing for England or playing for Ireland or, or, or other teams as well. It, it, at 18, it's very hard to sort of pinpoint someone's ceiling. And so it, if you don't make that initial pathway that you're trying You've put all this time and effort into rugby. You've done the 10,000 hours to get you up to that level. This is another way to use that time and that investment to help facilitate and continue your journey and help change your life. Yeah, of course. And on that, obviously, World Rugby also changed uh, the eligibility rules uh, from a three-year to a five-year period. So, you know, all of a sudden, you, know, you start looking at 16, 17, if you're not top-tier level at your school or potentially not getting a bite at the cherry at, at junior age group level, um, you know, to then, you know, have a process where you can get over to the States potentially, you know, through the help and aid of and a concierge service like ASM, you know, all of a sudden, 23 years old, um, you hopefully would have qualified or got a degree and you know educational backing of some sort but you now have an opportunity 23 years old to see where you are from a rugby perspective you know if you if you didn't get about the cherry five years prior you know potentially like many south africans in particular you know you now can potentially go on to represent the us or the uk or, or england or ireland you know so um probably not new zealand i don't think there's many south africans that have tried tried the, <laughs> yeah. the cherry and we're uh, waiting for that one we're waiting for that one um down down south but um i think that that's understanding that you know the rules have changed um but if you can't in five years you know make it in south africa can you at least 
try and make the American dream a reality, not only through sport, but also more through education. Um, exactly. And again, I know there's a lot of South Africans looking by a citizenship by investment opportunity. All of a sudden, you know, ASM could help you get that. There's the recruitment process for a job post, you know, post that initial studying period. And if that works out, you know, you could potentially set up a much improved life, um, you know, for you or, or your potential family. So I think there's a lot of considerations you have to go through. Understanding the process is not simple. You know, we're not coming to you with a silver platter and saying, okay, listen, here's your American dream. Um, there's hard work on ASM side. There's hard work on the individual side. And it's also, and I know we're focusing on rugby, but, you know, whether you're an, an athlete, so all of a sudden you could potentially, you know, be a winger who runs a, a 10.5, uh, hundred meters. And, you know, rugby has been great for you, but all of a sudden, you know, there's some, as college in the state says, you know, we can get you to a 10, two or 10, one. And, you know, that direction beers. And I think that's where ASM could even add further value, you know, to the mindset, you know, of getting to, to the state. So again, yes, this is purely rugby, but there are different avenues that ASM in particular can help you with in understanding, you know, the scope of what the American dream potentially is. No, absolutely. And, and I think that, that that's really it is, is an endless possibility. Uh, you know, ASM gives you the keys into a, and a route to get over here and to, but then it, it's up to you what you do with those opportunities in life and whether you want to follow those pro sports, whether you want to, you know, move, um, you know, into, you know, as a job and a life in America, that American dream and, and using this process as a vehicle for change in your life. And, and I know there's a big uh, in South Africa there, it, it just seems to be part of, you know, the identity of, of looking for, you know, part, uh, pastures, you know, greener and looking for other opportunities outside of the country. And this is another great one for students uh, across the board in that. Cool. Because cool. I don't know if you want to go through some of the questions in the chat there. Things yeah. like, you know, would, would colleges be concerned with gym statistics and ability in the gym? I mean, I think this is a great Dave, question. You, Dave, yeah. this is a great question for you. Yeah, 100%. I think there's, it's important to know it's two people you've got to impress to get into an American college. You've got to impress admissions as well as the rugby coach to support your, your application. So from a rugby side, highlights, gym statistics, how tall you are, your experience, what position you are is the kind of information you want to get to the coach, whether that's over a conversation, a lot of website, a lot of um, teams have websites with an application portal. You can put a lot of that data in so they get an idea of what they're dealing with and how you'd benefit their team. I think another thing to be really worth, like that's worthy to discuss is that, the percentage of applicants that are successful to, co to colleges in America ranges from like a Stanford, which might be 4% up to 40 or 60%, depending on the different schools that you apply to. So like, for example, at UCLA, we had 111,000, then 121,000 applicants, and then 144,000 applicants this year. I and mean, you think only about six to 8,000 of them get in on any given year, those percentage chances of it getting in get smaller and smaller. So using someone like ASM to make sure that your application both impresses the rugby coach at that rugby program but also you shine to the top of the pile within your admission application your essays making sure that you've got everything checked off your your sats that you're you're, you're able to articulate your character etc so i personally wouldn't be massive on like your gym statistics i'm a more of a rugby guy like see your footage see who you've played for what position you play for etc um because we're so one thing the u.s is so far ahead in is like physical prep of athletes and we can do a lot of that work over four years, like an academy would anywhere else in the world, where we get you to the physical state that you need to be to be competitive. I think your rugby, your nuance, especially coming from a country, whether it's South Africa, England, Ireland, that experience showing that through video um, is going to be more beneficial in my book anyway. No, I think that that's great, mate. And I just think I want to give you a little bit of a window as we can, then we'll continue with some of these questions, just to highlight a bit of UCLA the program, some of the growth in your visions and potentially if there's any recruits out here uh, as well, you know, that, that there is the, the portal on the website or they can reach out at corbs at asmscholarships.com and email me and I'll, and I'll connect you through that as well. And, and, and just a little window for yourself and your program. Awesome. Uh, one of the ones there is an age limit. Um, there is some rules in, in collegiate rugby about aging. So I think you have seven years post high school graduation to be eligible to play college rugby and then you have five years of eligibility within college rugby so um, if you haven't played professionally or collegiately somewhere else in the world and you're within seven years of your high school graduation you can play rugby in america at a college level for five years so that probably answers some of those questions about if you took a gap year 
about being a little bit older, etc. I think that answers a few of those questions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, let's look at some of that. If you want to take a gap year between high school and university, will that affect the process with ASM? Uh, Dave, I think you'll back me up, but no, not at all. I think, you know, you have that seven-year window from when you finish. If anything, from a coach's point of view as well, an extra year is just going to mean you're physically more developed, so he's going to get you a little bit older for your five years of potential eligibility. And if you have, you know, like we talked a bit earlier with Brian, if you are in a position where, you know, you feel like, you know, it's a bit of a rush with the end of this school, a gap year is a great opportunity where you can continue your rugby development, continue your growth and give you the time to get the application process and not rush it and find the right school for you and the right fit as well. Yeah, of course. And as something to that, I mean, I just uh, taking back to my history, you know, I matriculated, which is sort of ending school at 17 years old. So I was a year younger than everybody else. Um, I hadn't fully developed. I was literally weighing, I think something ridiculous, like 66 or 67 kilograms. I was like 174. I was like a scrawny. And I only got a lot quicker after school. Um, so something like a gap year is a consideration. But then again, it's financially, can you support that yeah. for yourself? Um, you know, if you're not a A grade level type of player, you know, you're sort of hovering about your first team, you know, second team, first team, uh, potentially second in your position. But that then potentially does give an opportunity to take a year out of understanding the process of getting into that system, you know, looking at various opportunities of not only improving your own physical um, being, but then also understanding, you know, the mental change and getting into the collegiate system, doing your SATs, understanding the difference in an education system from South African government schools, um, you know, potentially to, to the, U the US system, which is also, you know, really intricate um, understanding. Absolutely. And I think the maturity as well that, you know, going for, for these international students, you are coming a long way from home as well. You're going to be without your parents, your family, a new environment, uh, you know, some new new changes as well. So that extra year isn't always the worst thing from that point of view as well, because it is a big life changing move coming across you know, the Atlantic or the Pacific, whichever way you're coming and, 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 and you know, being away from your family and, and starting that dream. Um, one question here is what is the best age to start reaching out at ASM? We always, we, we advise the sooner, the better, uh, be, just because it gives you the most prep time to really sort of facilitate your application and your grades and understand that, you know, you're aiming for something now. So two, three years out from school, your average monthly report cards or term or semester, however it works are actually really important in your, you know, getting the right grade point average to be really, um, you know, really uh, desirable by schools and be able to qualify them. And then also it just gives you enough time to get your SATs in order, to take the, the practice SATs, to take the prep time, to give yourself the best opportunity to put the best application together to get into the best school of your choice. And it's just on that circles, another thing just around education, and obviously, you know, myself and, and Dave on, on our, and yourself and I done. Um, and rugby was very different. You know, when I matriculated back in 2000, you know, the game had only been four years professional. Um, it was very, very different. Education was sort of an alternate route because you weren't quite sure if you were going to make it in rugby. The game has exploded from a professional perspective. So there's a lot more opportunities with a lot of money. Um, not quite the, the soccer's and the, and the Ronaldo's and the Messi's of the world, but you know, guys like Owen Farrell, Ivan Etzevet and you know, Andre Pollard are not getting too, too bad a salary. But that said, you know, education is extremely important. Um, and it's also really important for everyone on the call to understand that ASM is not going to give you a scholarship if your education and, and your levels of marks are not at, at a level where it gets you into the collegiate system. Um, much like university in South Africa. So it's really important that, again, you know, rugby and professional sport is a massive dream that a lot of people have. Um, and it is important to understand that, you know, with that education is just as important, not only for while you're playing, but when you end, because all of a sudden, you know, 15 years of playing professional rugby is potentially great from a sporting perspective. But as soon as you go into the business world um, and you don't have an educational background on any sort, and, you know, I had to at the age of you know, 35 years old, you know, go to Toulouse Business School and write a 35 page thesis, which was extremely challenging, you know, and if I just completed my BSc IT degree, um, you know, in my first four years out of, out of school, things would have been a lot easier. So understanding that education, as much as the professional aspect or trying to get into the professional aspect of sport is extremely important. Absolutely. And, and, I, and I think Dave is nodding along with that as well as someone, you know, it, it, the, the, the level of degree and the opportunities you'll get from coming out of a school like 
UCLA uh, will change your life forever. And I think, you know, I did my degree in the evenings while playing rugby in London. I think I finished it when I was 26. Um, it took me five years, sort of part-time night school. So I, and, and you know, if, if, and if I could go back, I probably, I would have done it in those early development years where I had more time. So then I was already then prepared to help lay the foundation for post-rugby life and the real world and, and what that means instead of trying to partner at maybe some of the most intense part of my athletic career, still trying to tag on that academic, um, you know, uh, academic sort of workload and requirements at that time. I think if I could go back, I would have done it in the time where I had window and time and then just primarily focus on my, on my athletic career and then use that to set me up for post-athletic career. And that, that's one of the big proponents that got me involved with ASM scholarship is I've from my from my dad down have always had the importance of college education and higher education driven into me and and you know it, it was tough when you're chasing your sporting dream to really sort of make sure that you account for that and and, and factor that in um Thank dave talk, talk a little bit about some of the opportunities that, that ucla and, and, and education like what you you're able to offer potential students can do for the life after rugby Absolutely. I mean, I think you hit on a main point there that for a lot of in a lot of countries, like it's one or the other, you're pursuing the professional rugby dream, or you're getting an education. I think the US model offers you an opportunity to do both. I mean, our schedule, a lot of rugby program schedules, it's, it's equivalent to a full time academy schedule in terms of the amount of time you train, but you're also fully enrolled in an education and a really good one at that. So your opportunity to have a parallel line of your education, your rugby over those four years is something that's very different in America, probably than a lot of countries where you know, I know in Ireland and England, if you don't make um, an academy team, you're probably joining a club and you're training, you know, a couple of times a week. And then the opportunity for you to continue your development is more difficult. Um, so, yeah, I think you'd be a unique opportunity um, in the American system. Sorry, Alex, what was your question? I forgot. No, no, I was just about the opportunities that UCLA would give a degree from UCLA and what that gives someone in life. Yeah, I think it's really important to understand that like some of the colleges in America just open so many doors. They have so much prestige. They have so many links in the business world in America. They've been around for hundreds of years. And the opportunities for, you know, an Ivy School graduate, um, a UCLA graduate, and many other of these great schools in America opens up doors with our alumni. The alumni are really connected to the universities over here. So it's not like a lot of the countries in the world where like you graduate your, your college and then you never talk about it again. Here you're engaged for a lifetime. So there's employers, CEO, recruiting agencies, and you say, oh, I'm from UCLA, oh, I'm from this university or that university, it creates opportunities. And I mean, like a school like UCLA, I think LA Times did a, a study there a couple of weeks ago, and it came out in the newspaper that averaging salaries of like $90,000 within your first two years of graduation from UCLA. And a lot of the schools are able to connect you with their alumni. Like it's a big passion of mine and a lot of other college coaches is to engage the alumni for internship opportunities over the summer, get you into the field of your study. US model is quite broad. Like you're, you're, you're schooling, you pick a major after your first year. So you can kind of navigate what career path you take over the course of the four years and start specializing as well as, as you grow and get experience in the industry. And then using that alumni connection to create your first opportunity of meaningful employment post-college is huge over here. Absolutely. That's, it's a huge factor of American life. And it's something that we try and do with ASM and build our, our own alumni uh, network out and have, you know, the players that have been through our pathway service, you know, helping them connect them into jobs. We have some that actually work at ASM as well. And, and then also, you know, building up that then those potential people as they've gone on in their life and we've helped them that will look to hire the next generation of, of, of international students that are trying to chase that dream and, and align, you know, with, with the common, you know, love of rugby or sports or academics and, and build that sort of community feel. And, and I think that's one of the things, you know, it's, the UCLA is an amazing program that I love coaching and seeing the resources these students have, but that ability of, you know, helping with internships, not every school, not every program has been able to do that. And that's something, a resource that ASM can offer and support because it's, it's incredibly valuable to students to, to, to over that four years, use their whole experience in university to best prepare themselves for the next step of life, especially international students who only have that tiny window to secure, you know, long-term, uh, you know, residency in the United States. All right, I'm just going to scan through any more questions, see if anything really sticks out. Here's actually, yeah. could rugby place kickers be potentially picked up an American football team kicker college? This is massive. And this is something that people should be aware of. This is starting to happen more and more that the specialization of kickers in rugby 
it, with the right coaching can be very transferable to, to American football kicking. And there are a number of, you know, guys that have either left rugby that have now been training to kick or have come through the university set up and played rugby who are now looking at the NFL and the opportunities of kicking the NFL. And Dave, you know a little bit about tag leader, uh, an Irish player who's represented the USA, who's currently, you know, an MLR player initially, who's currently, you know, in, in the finer stages of making that transition. Yeah, 100%. I mean, Tyg also from Ireland came over. His brother Dara plays for Connacht, um, who's actually now over here doing a postgrad at Clemson University and an assistant coach with them. But Tyg came over, went to Linwood University, um, played rugby there, got his education, got into the MLR with San Diego, then with the New England Free Jacks. He um, very good kicker of the ball. And now he's had an opportunity to train with some NFL coaches on punting, on field goals. And he's at the last four weeks before a combine where the NFL teams are going to have start having a look at him. But at the moment, his numbers are phenomenal. Hang time on his punts, on his kick, on his uh, kickoffs, on his on his accuracy, on his field goals. So, I mean, we're all hoping with anticipation that Tig is the first of um, many. I think there has been a couple of rugby guys, a couple of Aussie guys in the past who were restarters. But hopefully this will be the first guy who organically comes through rugby in America and slides over into football. And I mean, hopefully he gets picked up and does well because it will only be another stroke for rugby in America that it's producing field goal kickers. So it'll be amazing. Absolutely. And as news of that starts coming out, you know there's going to be a lot of college football players who start looking at their college rugby team just to see if they have a, a kicker with that potential in the mix there too. I, I can see all that uh, unfolding. But I'm um, just scanning these last questions to see... Well, I do think it is really important. Obviously, I think there's a lot of questions around the financial aspect of ASM um, and understanding that. And I know we're not going to particularly go into the fee structure, um, but just you know, potentially give indication of, you know, when, when you're talking about, you know, you have to be in a position to be financially supported. You know, what does that mean? Does it mean you get a 50% scholarship? Does it mean the other 50% is in US dollars? It's paying your boarding fees, it's paying your lodging, it's paying all of these things. Because again, just understanding that ASM scholarships doesn't mean you get a free ride and a hundred percent. Absolutely. And it's unfortunately not like that in the U S collegiate system as, as much as everyone would like it. And, you know, ASM is definitely growing to a point where that could tend to be a future thing where one or two real scholarships can be given up. But at the moment, you know, what is, you know, being able to support yourself financially in, in the U S look like? No. So great, great question. And great. Let, let's use this as the point to finish. So this, Again, as we touched on, you know, the U.S. collegiate option is not for everyone because right now, especially with rugby, it's not a viable way. It's just a free ride. And if you have no financial resources behind you, it's it's a very uphill battle to, to, to chase this dream in the way that if you do have the financial resources. That's mainly because majority of the options are going to be 50 odd percent scholarships, which is going to reduce your fees in the U.S. for, you know, the average, I think, you know, Four year school in the US is somewhere around 40,000, somewhere between 25 and 40,000 dollars a year, Dave. You, you can back me up on that, is, is rough for the average tuition cost. So, what we're doing at ASM is we're probably gonna, we're going to half those on, on, on most of our rugby scholarships that we're able to secure. We usually half a fee like that. So, you already still have to be able to afford that sort of. $10,000, $12,000 ranges, some of your cost of living. A lot of schools will give extra assistance, academic scholarships, potential help with student, uh, you know, jobs for, for athletes on campus that can help afford their cost of living as well. But you've got to kind of be able to afford that sort of ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 bundle a year um, traditionally. And then you also then have to factor in our fee over ASM, which can be paid monthly over a long period of time or can be a one-off fee. And depending on the level of assistance and help, you know, that's somewhere around, you know, the the, the $5,000 mark, let's say. So realistically, year one, you've still got to have financial resources of somewhere in that fifteen dollars to $20,000 uh, you know, ball, ballpark. There is financial resources. I know we, we're going to do another webinar with more of the financial side, especially for, for South African students of how there's opportunities for student loans and ways to support that in certain schools that are that are offering those to those students. But, but on a whole, you know, that's kind of the price range of what you're going to be able to afford. So traditionally, we are looking at right now more private school students or students that have the resources to be a private school student and want to chase this dream long term. And as rugby keeps growing, uh, there is going to be more and more options for that. And if we look at the women's side of that, I'm not sure how many girls are on the call, but for the girls opportunities in America, 
it's actually a lot closer to a free ride and a lot cheaper, mainly because of something called Title IX, which I think we're going to do a separate webinar on women's rugby completely. But Title IX basically means every school has to give equal scholarships, uh, sports scholarships to, to men and women in the United States. So if you're a big program, you've got you know a football team, a basketball team, a bunch of big sports teams that make you money, you have to have an equal amount of those scholarships for women. So rugby is a lot higher on the list of female sports than men's sports. So there's a lot more D1 actual free rides in rugby. And so for, for, for those ones, maybe the budgets are going to be less for the females. But for, for, for the males applying, that's kind of what it's going to entail to be able to come over and, and, and get this dream. It's similar to uh, a, a reasonably level private school in the UK it would be very similar to what you'd be paying over here and similar to some of the schools in Australia. And, and I'm sure some of those schools exist in South Africa as well. And Dave, maybe just from a UCLA perspective, I mean, you know, are there examples of, you know, players within your system that have gone on to represent, you know, M MLR teams, you know, that have apparently then you know, gone back into the premiership or other reasons? Because I think there, there's also potentially a lot of concern around, okay, well, what does it really give me? You know, does it give me the right exposure? You know, we know rugby in America is growing. Um, I think everyone understands it is a sleeping giant and we're all sort of waiting for that whole TV rights and, you know, deal to come together. You know, but what is the system? You know, is there an opportunity to get into a draft system, really be noticed. Um, you know, obviously the coaching is, is really good. It's, it's not fully professional, but it's close as to fully professional as you're going to get in, in, in a system like America. Yeah, I think there's huge opportunities. I mean, before I was here, I was in Chicago and we've had 21 players go professional over the course of three years that I was there. You know, one guy got an opportunity with Clermont on trial and now he's playing in D2 in France. Another guy got a contract with Edinburgh um, in, the, in the Pro 14. Then moving out here to UCA, I've been here for a year. We've had three recent graduates who were already in the MLR. We've had two got, that got an opportunity to play in the World 10 Series this year who are seniors who I think would be high on the draft list for the MLR yeah. next year. So, And I think that number will just keep growing. I mean, the, the expansion rate of the MLR, the amount of new teams there are, they need these players. And that draft that they created in line with other American sports is going to create huge opportunities for the top talents coming out of college to go professional. And what's a growing league? I mean... As a league that's only three or four years old, to already have 13 professional franchises, that's a lot of playing opportunities that they're creating. Hugely. And, and there's also opportunities. There's been success stories of players coming through the collegiate who've then gone back to play sevens international honours for, for Australia, for, for other countries. Um, sevens is a massive part of the collegiate landscape in the US and more so with you know the, the the success of the U.S. teams, the Olympics, the 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 fact that it's a you know potential Olympic medal, those programs and the sport has a lot more merit in the U.S. So those you know the sevens opportunities are bigger as well. And then on a whole, I think uh, the, the the biggest area there's other success stories of people like Blaine Scully, you know, who who came from you know American raised rugby player, went to Cal Berkeley, which is one of the premier. Uh, programs in the United States, big rival uh, of Dave and I's, but they have an amazing program. Um, you know, they, they, they don't offer scholarships, but they can tag players. And they also uh, is a world-class education as well. And someone like Blaine Scully, who came from the US, went to that program and then had a lot of success abroad as well, shows that the, the pathway is there to still get you good enough to, to reach some of the highest levels. Blaine went on to play at Leicester Tigers. He played at Cardiff Blues. He captained the U.S. international team to a World Cup. You know, they're, they're more, there's going to be more and more Blaine Scullies. These are just the trailblazers who are able to do it, I think, in where the, 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 the new pathway that's being developed wasn't quite ready yet. And when now I think that pathway is really being built out, reinforced, the MLR see the massive value in the collegiate system and the, just the fact of the responsibility the MLR now have as, as individual financial capital, independent financial capital, investing in growing rugby in all these areas around the US, it's only benefiting the collegiate program. There's now better assistant coaches. There's now better resources. Those coaches get to watch training and see, it, see what these professional teams are doing. A lot of the professional setups have... Uh, foreign coaches and so you're getting all these sort of ideas and rugby IQ and knowledge diffusing its way across the US that the, that the process and the sort of pathway is only going to get stronger and stronger and better preparing you for top level rugby all right quick scan of the questions and I think then we are going to sign it off there should I, I attend think Alex is um, I mean just while you're going through the questions there but 
there most of these big colleges run a summer camp. I mean, we run one at the end of the July, but a lot of schools do run those summer camps. And if you've the financial means to do it, like coming over to the States for a week, experiencing firsthand the coaching, the campus, the facilities, the weather, and seeing it for yourself and how much, how huge it is. And, and you, I think you'll just be amazed at the experience. I know, Alex, you went over to Cal when you were 18 and saw it firsthand. But for someone to come over, I think it'll blow your mind to see the status and the stature of some of these colleges. So if you can have that opportunity, I'd take it. Yeah, there was a question on summer camps. I was just about to answer. And, and I agree. I do think for, for players potentially looking to come over, it's a great way to build a relationship with the coach. Show them firsthand what you're actually able to do on the field in front of their eyes and not on a stat sheet or, or, or a YouTube page. And then, and then actually then get the feel for the, the college. There's a lot of the time the current players help out in those camps. You get to meet some of the guys, speak to them, really feel the environment. It is a definite, uh, if you have the financial means to do that, it is, I would recommend it as, as part of the process to make sure this is for you and to find uh, the best relationship. And there was one question on there, I can't see it right now, but it was basically talking about with COVID and there being no games, um, you know, any advice for getting noticed or, or for coaches and and that's why i think you know without trying to like spin it as like a salesman like oh covid means actually asm's role could benefit players even more i genuinely think there is there is something to be said in that that if you can't you know haven't been able to play for a year or two it's almost more important to have some form of you know uh, connection to the coach uh, as possible because your rugby can't just do all the talking for yourself with the with the impact of COVID over this last year and and I think it does lend that then uh, getting assistance on the process would definitely make it a lot easier for you if you don't have any highlights or anything to show coaches purely because there's just been no games. Absolutely, I mean it's super. Com- the ones that do have uh, you know scholarship opportunities, it's incredibly competitive. I mean they've got a lot of guys from all around the world applying to go to their universities. And a lot of those coaches, like, yeah, they want to have high quality players, but character is a huge thing. And, you know, going about it the right way, especially like if Alex rang me on behalf of ASM and said, hey, mate, I have a lock here. He's playing in South Africa. He's got the grades. He goes to this school. I've talked to him. So is Gavin. He's a great kid. I've met his parents. That automatically will put him towards the top of my list. His character, his family, everything has been referenced. And I, I feel like I know the guy a little bit more. Some guys, I mean, my advice, and it's a pet peeve of mine, some guys are really informal about how they reach out to colleges. Like I get DM slides on Instagram and like text messages been like, Hey, I'm Irish. I'm South African. Give me a scholarship. And I mean, like that is a fast track to getting off on the wrong foot with a coach. So going through an agency, going through the formal channels, writing a formal email with the stats, with your highlights, with your information, your academics is going to get you off on the right foot with these coaches. Absolutely. I think that I think I think we've done it, lads. I think I think we've done this well for the first for the first debut uh, webinar. Uh, thank you to everyone who joined. We're going to try and make these a monthly thing and we'll, we'll dive into other sports and in other areas and topics and questions that you guys have and just try and um, give you as much information on the process itself, but also the resources that ASM can offer. Um, if you want to learn out more, please go to www.asmscholarships.com. Tons of research on there. If you just put in your email and address, um, we have a quick little survey where you can type your d- details in and we'll basically respond to you, letting you know if you really would be worth qualifying for a scholarship, what your opportunities are, and then potentially take the next step with the with the process. So for everyone listening, I appreciate you coming for our guests here. Thank you so much for your time and continued support with rugby in general, but also with ASM and, and, and to everyone else. You know, please check out what we do and, and I really support it. And, uh, you know, final words from you two to say goodbye. Uh, Corps, just quickly on on the ASM thing. So obviously in South Africa, there's quite a few scouts. I'm not quite sure what it's like in the rest of the world. You know, how do people know exactly, you know, who is it, you know, ASM scouts in country-specific areas? You know, I know they can go to the website, but you know, is there a way of vetting or verifying? Because, you know, a lot of people will say ASM scholarships or whatever. So how do those potentially wanting to find out more, um, and again, in country, there are potential people saying they're from ASM. Um, you know, how do you verify that? How do you really understand exactly, you know, who to go to? Great question. So all of our scouts are listed and verified on the website. So if you go to ASM, there is an option with the scouts. And so and we do have a number of the scout program. One of the way that we've built up 
our recruitment is by uh, having scouts that, that end up sort of recruiting for us, finding students that are in the local rugby scene that are around there that use social media. But at the same time, please do, if you need to verify or check, you should see some sort of affiliation with the main ASM scholarships page. I think that would be, you know, one of the first things to look for, but go on the website. You can verify and check the scout is on there. They're all listed on there. And, and, and that is how I would advise everyone because yes, it can be very confusing. The easiest way is just to go to the website at ASM Scholarships. If you are dealing with a scout or someone reaches out to you and, and, and they sort of you know tickle your fancy, please go to the website and just check and verify. Because having a scout that also knows the process, knows your, you know, your level of rugby that is more in tune to you on the local scene will probably sell you better to, you know, to the to the to the coaches and the service, then, you know, maybe just reaching out yourself, but, but ASM on a whole, whether it's one of our scouts or through the website, uh, it, it, it's an absolutely fine pathway to getting onto this program. Brilliant. No, thanks. Paul. I think that was extremely insightful that uh, David was brilliant to hear about UCLA and hoping that, you know, Adam Ashley Cooper um, and Matt Gitter somehow lured Drew Mitchell over to, to I Atlanta know the band's got to come it, back together, man. The, the band, um, if the band does get back together, it'll be some, some really good, good crack and some, some proper band over there. But I think really, you know, add just, you know, how you can have longevity in, in, in your rugby career, which I think would be brilliant. So, yeah, it was really informative, of course, looking forward to the next one. Um, you know, we, we could potentially dive into a lot more detail around the financial aspect, um, you know, the actual education perspective of it. But I think a, a great start. Um, I'm not quite sure if I'm going to be the loose head or Dave's going to go for the hooker. So we were sort of deciding that at the moment. It's, it's, mate, you're the hooker on my little Zoom panel, so I think we'll just keep it that way. I'm at loose head where I belong, and Dave's on the tight. So, so we're, in, we're in a good place. It'd be a privilege. Hell of a sevens from row as well. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Brian. You're a legend, mate, on, on and off the field. And, and Dave, you, you are too. I appreciate you guys' time. Thanks, everyone, for listening, and uh, let's sign off. See ya. Cheers, guys. Be blessed. Stay safe.